Welcome to Raising Kids in the Digital Age. Uh, today we're with Quinn Middle School Principal Jason Webster out of Hudson, Mass. How are you doing today, Jay? Doing well, Jeff. How are you? Is it okay to call you Jay? Jay's fine. Jay is a uh, intimidating, presen intimidating presence in the paint. He'll tell you a little bit as, about his background as a basketball player and as an educator and a mainer. And we're going to uh, continue this conversation about raising and educating kids in the digital age. So give us a little bit of your background, Jay. All right. I, uh, well, uh, Mainer, uh, self-proclaimed Mainer, but I, uh, to tell you the truth, I moved when I was nine uh, from London Air, New Hampshire, up to Maine. Um, and I uh, was lucky enough to be on some successful basketball teams in high school. Went on to play college ball at Trinity College and the University of Maine, Farmington, before uh, growing up and figuring out what I wanted to be when I grew up. And so I was a middle school math teacher in the sixth and eighth grade and um, spent uh, two, three-year stints as an assistant principal uh, at the middle school level, and I'm currently uh, going into my fifth year as principal of uh, the middle school in Hudson. And what, what year did you graduate from uh, Farmington? Uh, you made Farmington grad 2000. 2000, 18 years ago. Roughly, so, yep. So you are close to 40 years of age. Pretty close. I'm on the, uh, the back end of it. Just turned 43. Ah, back end. Okay. And I being 62, uh, some of you listeners may know I started as a junior high school teacher back in the day in the 80s and then went back to grad school and became a counselor. And uh, the cause nearest and dearest to my heart is figuring out ways that the grown-ups in the lives of kids can, can smooth out the path and we can have less, we can have fewer tragic results, of course, and have, have more joyful results of young people who can... Uh, can uh, deal with the slings and arrows of the usual outrageous fortune without so much of the digital, what's the word, Jay, the digital complications. Right, yeah, more analog. I mean, uh, these aren't words that you hear in common parlance, but uh, you and I have used them. And yeah, we have, uh, and I, I just, you know, I know that in our talks we've talked about how... Get on know, that microphone, my friend. How we've watched... Oh, boy. Watched... Uh, you know, kids uh, in, in our professions you know, struggle through their, uh, their childhood, their adolescence, and, you know, becoming adults and, and just kind of everything that's been thrown at them, both uh, with life and uh, the digital age. It's, it's uh, a lot to uh, swallow. It's a lot to swallow, and we want to get your, we want to dig into your thoughts and opinions and observations on, on the nature of that struggle for kids and parents and educators, and also naturally on solutions. Uh, right. Since the last podcast, uh, we've all been working, colleagues of mine and I and Jason's been on, on some of the conversations uh, on the reconnection project uh, that we'll be, we'll be unveiling here soon to schools, which is my nearest uh, approach to how we can start solving some of this problem. But maybe it would be useful if you could talk about the change. You got out of college and what'd you say, double O or O? Yeah, it took me a little while to find my way. Uh, I was at Trinity for about two and a half years, took a year off to work, and then transferred to UMaine, uh, and I received my undergrad in 2000. At the age of? 25. So 18 years ago, you graduated college. I mean, could you talk about in any meaningful way about the, the differences you see in a school, kids, teachers, parents, between back in the day and now? And we'll start up here and maybe we'll zero in. What do you see that's different? Back in the day when I was in school? If you like. Sure. Uh, well, I think when I was in school, you were not exposed to as much uh, information. Um, you know, you actually had to, I was actually talking to my dad about this, you had to read the paper the next day to find out if the Red Sox won, um, as opposed to uh, looking down at your phone and, and seeing, you know, how many, uh, what, what was the count, you know, in the seventh inning, you know, as things were live. Um, you know, and I think that there were much more social interactions occurring. Uh, I, I tend to default to the middle school level, uh, since that's kind of where I live now in my career, but also just thinking He's the back. tallest kid in middle school. Tallest kid, uh, 43, it's just like Six I'm... Six foot uh, seven, 43 years Billy Madison, ago. yeah, never going to grow up. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, no, I, I just, I remember that... Um, you know, it was, you know, you get done school and it was okay. We were starting to talk to uh, your buddies. Uh, let's come over to my house and we're going to choose up teams and play basketball. Um, as opposed to now, you know, I sit in my office and if I'm talking with students and finding out what they're doing after school, they're, they're going back, throwing the headsets on, they're playing Fortnite or whatever 
uh, you know, role playing RPG uh, video game. Um, role playing game. Role playing RPG. game RPG, uh, and they are over the interwebs uh, talking to their friends uh, from their couch, and so they don't need to go outside and do all those uh, social things that we used to do. They would rather. Uh, would you say? So how many students go to the Quinn Middle School? About 650. Is it your view, and it's anecdotal, certainly, but is it your view that they would rather be in their room looking at a screen with headphones on, quotes talking to their friends, or I think is it 50-50? They'd rather go play with their friends? What do you say? My opinion, my guess is that it's over 50-50. There are still kids that go out and play basketball and do those things, but there are fewer and further between. Um, I, there are more kids that are, they go home and that's it. And, you know, it's all about what games they have and, and uh, getting online or texting or using the, you know, the different media apps that they have on their phones. Um, why, why the addiction? Why, why are these kids drawn to those, to those devices so, do you think? Well, because it, it, it connects them with their friends. I, I think, uh, especially at the middle level, the, um, you know, pre-adolescent kid is so interested to uh, to fit in, but yet be unique all at the same time. Everything is socially motivated, and I think all of the ways that they are tripping over themselves and learning um, that that's a healthy part of how they grow up. And you know, when I was a kid and there was no you know internet, Facebook, or anything like that, you had to go up to the girl that you were uncomfortable you know uh, talking to and, and fall on your face and and, and try and, and talk and sound like an idiot and learn from it. Uh, and now you can do it from a distance. And if you're a, uh, you know, a young kid, 10, 11, 12, 13 years old, and you have the option of either saying something in front of somebody's face and being nervous of their response, or hiding behind a screen and being able to type it and hit send, and then you know, put your phone away in your pocket and go have a sandwich, you're probably going to choose the latter. And that's just human nature. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that that's you know, expedited itself you know, exponentially um, you know, over the years here so that uh, nowadays, you know, th there are less people. You go drive past the playgrounds now and you don't see as many people out there as you used to. No, I mean, that's... that. The, the, the anecdotal evidence clearly points to a lot of things that are concerning to, uh, to educators and parents if we, if we think about it and we talk about it. The empty playgrounds, that, that kids are largely at that age socially motivated, there's no question. That seems to be the way God made us, right? Mm -hmm. I would agree. And what I hear you saying is that the in the in the protective sphere, I think you called it the interweb, right? Right. Yeah. One doesn't have to be face to face and face the butterflies about the next hurdle, whether it's talking to a member of the opposite sex or the same sex, or talking to your teacher, or joining the four square game outside if they still play four square. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, you, they do. Yeah, uh, they do play Foursquare, um, but I, you know, I think that all of those things are connected, uh, and it's also connected with school, with education. I, I think that you know that awkwardness that we talk about with those social interactions, it's about being uncomfortable, and the way that you learn is by having these uncomfortable experiences and then learning from them, right. and then making little adjustments. Uh, that's middle school, and you know when you aren't practicing that as much and you're not as comfortable screwing up as much you're going to be less comfortable in the classroom raising your hand to answer a question you're it's all be, it's all into it's all connect. connected yeah yeah you're not as comfortable with risk you're not as comfortable facing anxiety and and surmounting anxiety and i think also when you go home oftentimes one or both of your parents and lucky that you have both is or are on their own iphone yeah um yeah. and that I feel like at a granular level, kids are receiving less mirroring and less attention. So if you, if you, if you put it together while well, mom's kind of busy, I'm in fifth grade. You have fifth through seven here, right? Correct. I'm, I'm a little boy or girl. In fifth grade, I think you're maybe 10 or 11. Fifth grade, you're 10 or 11, yes. Sixth grade, you're 11 or 12. Seventh grade, you're 12 or 13. Right. So if I'm 10 or 11 or 12, I'm preteen. It used to be quite well accepted that these were years where it's okay to fail and fall and learn. Mm -hmm. How was school, Jay? Um, you know, when you come home and your mom's not on an iPhone, and my mom wasn't. Right. So they were more available at a granular level to support you. Mm -hmm. And I think when you'd walk in the door, if you look kind of chagrined, somebody might say, hey, you okay? And you might want to be strong and say, yeah, but then if you're 10, you're going to find out, uh, your parents are going to find out pretty quickly that you're sad about something. And they may give you some advice about it. 
Yeah, and uh, and you know what's frustrating, and I speak because I'm one of those uh, parents. Let's uh, be on that mic now. We got about a, the uh, the parents are uh, and a half, yeah. are yeah. Uh, parents are just as much you know I as a, as a dad am just as much uh, on my phone uh, dealing with you know the emails that come in the the work emails other things. Um, you know, the, the barrage is there for us just as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so as a parent, you know, you're less, uh, you have more white noise, more things tugging at you, more information that you could be reading or, or you know, taking in, tugging at you. And so that I feel as a parent, I am less um, in some ways tuned in right. to, you know, how my kids are. They come, you know, home off the bus and, hey, how was school? And eh, it was fine. You know, you don't get any answer, but it's, it's a different well, you're, uh, dialogue you're, now. Different, different. The, the the nature of that dialogue from a psychological perspective, mm -hmm. from a child rearing perspective, has done a one eighty. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's fair to say. So I was born in fifty six. You were born in what? Seventy five. Nineteen seventy five. Nineteen years or so. I think I think parents in the fifties and sixties there was a little bit of seen and not heard going on, but as a very general statement, one's mom. It was sort of her duty back in the in the sexist days to watch the kids, and I think most moms were checking their kids and would look in their eyes, and I think people are just fundamentally, as you just said, fundamentally distracted. So it's scary if you're a psychologist or an educator mm -hmm. or a thoughtful parent, and you think that. So not only are kids having more difficulty facing adversity, but in some ways we're removing the adversity at the, at the same time as we're kind of neglecting kid on a granular level oh yeah it's it, kids are being um I, I can't think of the term right now but uh you know that they, they're if they're having a hard time and you're a parent you know you can give them you know here play angry birds on your ipad for a little while you know and and so that's how you parent like you can you can distract digital them babysitter yeah yeah and um you know that wasn't an option you actually had to, you know, do the one arm swim when you're in the grocery wagon driving, to, you know, to the to the store or whatever. And you're like, hey, knock it off. You, you got to deal with it, as opposed to, all right, I'm going to give, you know, Johnny his his uh, iPad and and Susie her iPad, and that way they can live in their own little worlds, playing video games or, or Snapchat. Or whatever. So in fairness, I mean, parents have always said, hey, go play with your blocks, uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or you know, but I, the 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 one arm swim, you know, the i the, these gizmos are so. I'm looking at the MacBook into which we're putting these, these, these voices, but the imagery, I remember being a kid just watching, you know, imagery on TV, commercials. You'd watch the commercial because there's something fascinating about it. Right. And I think, I think psychologists are starting to study the addictive nature of changing images. Mm -hmm. I know that when, I think this was in a podcast, somebody said to me when, uh, what's the game you just mentioned? That Angry all, Birds. No, no, the other one that the middle school kids Fortnite. play. Fortnite first came out the colors were more or, more earth tones and that they actually changed them to brighter more dramatic colors which caused a deeper addiction mm -hmm. so digital babysitting this this web it, it really is I'm learning through these podcasts in my experience it's all connected mm -hmm. if you have parents who are distracted if you have kids who are unsure of themselves if you have a culture in which facing adversity is becoming less and less popular mm -hmm. it all spells trouble it does. It talk, does. Talk, to, talk to us about running a school in digital 2017. Uh, w one of the first things that comes to mind is uh, we, we have weekly meetings with our, our uh, counselors, our guidance counselors, school counselors, uh, and that's a great opportunity to just kind of keep a pulse on the needs of our kids. Um, you know, you have students that have uh, individual uh, education plans and they have support. You have other students with, with needs. Perhaps they're, uh, you know, an English learner. Uh, and then you have kids that, quote, unquote, kind of fall through the cracks, kids that might not have been identified yet, um, but uh, they struggle in some way, and we're in the process of figuring out how to identify it and help them. Uh, the latter uh, situation or scenario I just described, it, it describes most of the kids. They're all going to struggle. Uh, and I just I remember one of the first conversations I had uh, with our um, counselors was that they you know were kind of frustrated. They do a lot of work with these social groups to talk to kids about how they can you know problem solve with each other and uh, you know have those conversations. And it's okay for someone to be upset and show that they're upset with them 
and that now it's up to them to be able to respond appropriately as a friend, as a, a peer, and that that's okay. It doesn't feel good, but it's okay because you're learning how to interact and work together. Uh, the frustration came from the fact that uh, lunchtime, which is a petri dish of opportunity for our, you know, our students after learning from these uh, social groups to, to interact, uh, lunches were quieter which was great if you're on duty for that lunch, but they weren't interacting. They were eating their sandwich or their Oreos and, and playing on their devices. Not due to the social groups, but just due to the advent just of the, the devices. Yeah, we had a bring-your-own-device program here oh, at the school, which was fantastic. Okay. But that So now uh, an unwanted side effect was the kids were pacifying themselves with these video games. So we, I, was, I was like, you're, you're right. So one of the first things we did was we said, no more technology during lunch, which made sense. And so now... The lunches were louder because their kids now interacting. There's nothing for them else to do. They're forced to interact. But they were able to start to practice and fall and, 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 and struggle and, and have those awkward conversations, but then try again and, and, and practice those skills. And so it helped a little bit. Now, we didn't save the world, but it was just that's one example of how things have changed so much. You know, especially with ours being a newer school, we're going into our sixth school year. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we were kind of wired for sound here with the technology we can offer. And it was working in some small ways to the detriment of our kids. I ultimately feel that it all comes down to, to me as a, as a school leader. I'm trying to facilitate an environment where kids can feel comfortable struggling and failing. Well, you're swimming against the tide, it seems to me. And again, my observations are anecdotal. Mm -hmm. But if you have empty playgrounds and you have parents in the offices of school leaders um, speaking for their children when somebody gets a C plus and they feel it's undeserved. Uh, basically, you're hamstringing, child hamstringing children's ability to grow in terms of, of, of independence, mm -hmm. grow in terms of courage. Uh, courage develops when you face anxiety-producing situations and try anyways, right? Mm -hmm. So you're hamstringing courage and independence and imagination. All and I'm learning as I go, Jerry. So when you look up, did you, you took a lot of psych courses. You look up Eric Erickson, The Eight Ages of Man. Does that ring a bell? Mm -hmm. Basic trust versus mistrust. Right. Uh, initiative versus guilt. Uh, autonomy versus doubt. Uh, I, I, I should memorize all eight, but it, it, it's occurred to me from the armchair of a psychologist that you want to be on the left side of the versus sign in Erickson. You want to have basic trust. You want to have initiative. You want to have generativity. You want to have imagination, independence, autonomy. I can't remember them all. Uh, intimacy versus isolation. You want to be... Uh, we're spending too much time... We're, 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 we're in a digital pea soup. Mm -hmm. and, and coming to a comprehensive understanding of that soup as educators and parents, to my, my mind, is imperative. Because without that understanding, and you've heard me say this a million times, we're going to lose more children uh, to opiates and suicide. We're going to lose more children to a kind of uh, tragic morass of, of anxiousness. Mm -hmm. Am I making sense? I mean, do we see more anxious kids? I think that, you know, it is it is more of a concern. And, and the point that I just, to the side, would want to make, you know, education does, uh, you know, realize that we benefit from this technology. I, I think it's, it's a good thing that we have more available to us and more ways that we can teach. Uh, the, the issue becomes, you know, the students and, and the kids and us, it, we're bombarded with it now so much that we're, we're misusing it. And, and it's around us so much that we just we've struggled to be able to keep things. You know, my mom always said everything is at, you know, uh, you know, in moderation. Everything in moderation. Jay, you, you can have a Snickers bar, but if you're going to eat twelve of them, it's right. probably going to be a stomach ache. And you can expand on that for whatever you want. But, you know, it's good that we have, uh, you know, we can get information quickly. You know. Uh, doctors are able to do greater things now than they used to. No question. Um, you know, and we can anticipate things, and the weather forecast is so much... Well, we're in New England, then we'll see where it goes. But y you get my point. Right. The, the drawback to that is we're putting it in the hands of the kids. Well, not only that, but the parents you know, are also... We're, as a parent, we're realizing, oh, my God, like it's happening to me, too. Right. And so where do you draw the line? You know, as an administrator, where do I draw the line as far as, like, I need to take a break so that I can be a dad on a Sunday afternoon 
and you you know you make those decisions and you and you you weigh those balances. But right, but you get you do the dad thing and you go back to the old bo box and you got forty seven emails on a Sunday. If I'm lucky, yeah. You mean you may have one hundred and forty seven? Mm -hmm. True number. Mm -hmm. So you could spend a Sunday afternoon playing basketball with your daughters and having fun, being a dad, disconnecting from digital gizmos, and come back after four or five hours. And have over a hundred emails. That it wouldn't be that much. Um, oh, after a weekend, perhaps. Um, you know, it depends. Every school district is different. You know, you got a lot. If of you said things. to your staff and your parents, "Look, it's the weekend. We're all going to take time off from email." Mm -hmm. would, would you? Would people hospitalize you? Attempt to hospitalize? No, you? I think it's always those what ifs. You're always concerned about the what ifs as far as something that might happen in the district, and and you know, we'll we call we you. Right, right. And so we do have responsibilities, but I think it's also, yes, the perception of, you know, availability and, and uh, it, it's tough because I think as a society, you know, there used to be knobs on the TV that you could click, you'd have to get up and walk over, heaven forbid, and, and tr change the channel, maybe adjust the rabbit ears a little bit. But now it's point and click. You don't like what you want. You, you hit the, you know, the remote button. Not even that now. You can watch Netflix on your phone. You don't Addiction even to instant, instantness. Instantaneity, yeah. We need instant, instant, what is that word? I instantaneity? Just instantaneity. I don't know. Instantaneity. Instant. We want everything instant. In an instant. And we become, the ego in the human breast is strong. We want what we want. We have everything instant now. Mm -hmm. So if I have an issue on a Saturday at around 10 p.m. and I'm a, my son is in the sixth grade and I think about it and I want to get your attention, I go j.webster at so-and-so. And I'm probably expecting you to answer me probably the next day, maybe Saturday at 10. the next 24, 48 hours, yep. You would, you would, and so it comes Sunday at dinner time. I haven't seen an answer from my son's principal. Perhaps I'm getting a little agitated. Mm -hmm. But my son's principal, he should be on the job. He's not out playing basketball with his daughter. Or he needs to be on the job. I, I, I'm a little addicted to the instantaneity. I need it now. Mm -hmm. Is that it? That's, a, that's out there. I, I think there are people that, you know, when I, uh, when I respond, and I don't get to everything within the 2848 all the time, um, but, you know, I, I feel that I'm able to have those conversations with uh, parents and, you know, explain to them, like, hey, it took a little bit of time, but let's, let's resolve. We always focus on resolving the issue. And then, you know, if there's a, you know, if there's a, a mea culpa to do, then, you know, then we'll take care of that. But it's always, the focus is always on the student, on the kid, making sure that they're okay. Um, and obviously, you know, depending on the level of need, you know, there, I still, you know, yes, we have um, confidence that we'll be contacted if there really is an emergency. Um, is the job of a principal... Did you know your junior high school? Did you go to junior high or middle school? I went to both. I was at a junior high school up through the seventh grade, and then I was at a K to eight school that actually had middle school teaming uh, in my eighth grade year. I mean, can you speak intelligently to this? Is your job a lot different than the principal of the school you went to, or the principal of a school five years ago, or ten years ago? Ten years ago, sure. Yeah. I, the, Oh, that's the PA. I thought it was your iPhone. I don't know if the listeners can hear that. No, I, th I think that you... It's, it's different and the same. I, I think the, the rate at which you respond to things um, and are forced to work through situations has uh, quickened. There are more situations to work mm -hmm. through. Yep, and then there are, there are more things on your plate now, too, uh, because now that you can receive things uh, quicker and you can be... Um, things can be brought to your attention quicker... Uh, then it's like you need to be able to respond in, in some ways quicker. Um, part of my job is to, you know, I receive from a lot of different stakeholders in a lot of different positions, whether it be, you know, students, parents, staff, members of our community, families, uh, present me with concerns. And then there are times where I need to kind of figure out which concern is the most important and most imperative and then address that. And sometimes that means that others, other concerns, other legitimate uh, issues uh, have to be put on hold or, or otherwise delegated so that at least somebody could respond. But, um, you know, that is part of the, you know, Absolutely. Now. Uh, well, my mind's going in two different directions. So lately, although I don't know I've ever seen one live, but I think of the digital octopus. You've seen an octopus probably. Mm -hmm. You're more well-traveled. Eight legs. Huh? Eight, eight legs. legs. I think our digital octopus has at least eight, maybe more. Mm -hmm. But when you, when you take it all into account, the kids are more anxious. They're not as used to facing adversity. The parents, I think, are more anxious. We have email. 
We have global warming, we have opiates, we have school shootings, we have dysfunction in Washington. We have screen addiction all around. So I think I probably named nine, so maybe we'll call it the, what's the word for oct for nine, octet? The nine, nine of us. The nine of us. Mm -hmm. Maybe we might have a, 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 a decapus. We might have ten main tentacles. What does it all add up to for a principal, for a dad? What does it all add up to if you had to give a su summary statement? Well, that is, it adds up to stress, anxiety. It, I, I think all those things add to uh, the daily life and, and trying to make reason of things. Uh, it makes it harder to make decisions. Make reason of things. What does that mean? Make reason of things. Um, to reason through things? Yeah. You know, I, you may as use words are very interesting. We, we do. I, I, I guess I can only speak for myself and my own thought process. Right. I know that if I have other things kind of on the back burner, the more that those things increase, the harder it is for me, just I know myself, it's harder for me to be able to stay in the moment and focus on an issue because I've got all these other things, you know, in that, the back I, your mind. that have to be addressed the moment that I'm done dealing with this. And then I'm also, you know, wondering to myself, should I be handling one of those other things right now? Because maybe one of those issues are brewing and expanding, and I need to check up on that. So it's it's tough, you know. You got the everyone can tell you about the you know the um, vision of all the plates spinning, yeah. you know, in the air. It's just yeah. when there's more of them, it's it's tough. And I think we so we all have more plates, including the kids. I mean, mm -hmm. my mind is flashing to two rising juniors. I work with this high school football team, so uh, common names Zach and. Uh, I think it's uh, Cole, maybe. We're down in Orleans, Mass., Cape Cod. Mr. Levin, I'm on vacation down the Cape for a week. Great. Uh, Mr. Levin, oh, you ought to take and ride up to the Heights in Orleans and park at Priscilla's Landing and take this really cool walk down the sand road, and you'll come to the cliffs above the Atlantic. Awesome. Uh, Zach, well, that sounds awesome. If we have time, we'll do it. Mr. Levin, I thought you were on vacation. Don't you have time? Oh, we're working out. We have a lot to do. So the definition of vacation has changed. Mm -hmm. and the, for kids, the kids have plates, a lot of plates, mm -hmm. a lot of plates spinning. And I think if you're from a, if you're from a family that values education, I was going to say middle class, which is incorrect. If you're from a family that values education and values achievement, as we should, you, you used to have school and a sport or two. And, and that was, that was and maybe you took music lessons or something adjunct. Right. Now you have school, a lot of school, a lot more homework, maybe a few sports, certainly travel sports. Follow? The, the pressure to achieve is it's second to none. I mean, mm -hmm. So we all got plates. We're all stressed. Sure. That's the point. Absolutely. The octopus is with us. It's in our lap. People don't know its name. That disturbs me. You know, uh, this is sort of a, uh, a happy image of an octopus, but this isn't that. Uh, I, I'm at risk for being a pessimist. So a lot of, a lot of people that know me well will, will say maybe I'm making too much of it. But I have to be, argue that when I look at suicide rates and anxiety rates and stress rates and sort of the secret suffering that goes on for children with whom I've been working Monday through Friday every week for 38 years, I'm disturbed, very disturbed by it. Hence, hence the podcast, mm -hmm. and hence the reconnection project. Yep, and and I think my my connection as a as a school leader is similar because until we can address with human beings, with students, and with teachers, you know what those things are that are stressing them uh, and causing these anxieties, these issues that that are unnamed. Um, until we can successfully do that, everything else is is secondary. You know, that, that struggling student, you know, until you can figure out what it is that you need to do to make a connection with that child, you know, the greatest curriculum in the world isn't going to make a hill of beans difference because no. you haven't been able to connect with him or her so, so the, that they can trust you. The connection's afraid. Mm -hmm. The trust is more afraid. Mm -hmm. there, are, there are more children that need our help. I think at home sometimes they struggle to say, hey, Dad, I need help. Mom, I need help. Yep. Partly the age, the age of the child, partly the age. Mm -hmm. You don't want to disappoint your parents, right? So you come to school, you have only a, you only have a, well, one quotient of ability to contain it, so it comes out. 
your teachers see that you look sad or stressed or you're yelling in the lunchroom or you're failing to do your work. Right. And you have more kids you have to catch in that basin, mm -hmm. in the rye, if you will. Catch them. You got There are more kids to catch. Mm -hmm. You and your staff are more with the plates more stressed out. Mm -hmm. So I guess it adds up. So where do the solutions lie, Joy? Where, how do you solve this problem? You have endless money. You have endless power. You're the emperor of all things educational and familial. How do you begin to solve this problem, dear emperor? I well in uh, in my own nirvana, I think you, you drop everything else and you just start with the uh, relationship between the uh, the teacher and the student. In my world, um, you know, uh, with the educator and the uh, the educatee, and you start there. You start with uh, just getting to know uh, your your audience. You know, teachers getting to know students, administrators getting to know their staff and their students, um, and you start there. And, uh, and you, you kind of front load your time building those relationships and sharing expectations and clarifying them. And sometimes it's going to take, you know, a kind of broken record aspect where you're repeating yourself so that the kids then can start to feel comfortable. And once you kind of have a sense of that, then you can feel that, you know, as the school year progresses and you're going to hit those bumps in the road, at least you're speaking from a, a, a place where the kids trust you. Um, you know, we're working in... Uh, I'm lucky enough to be, you know, affiliated with a, an organization for middle schools that tries to put together resources and, uh, and, and opportunities in professional development for teachers. And we keep talking about, well, what do we need to provide for, for educators? It's, it needs to be something that sticks, that's meaningful, that they can take back to their classrooms. And most of the time, that translates to how I can become, you know, more in tune with my kids. Um, a lot of the... Uh, you know, successful speakers that, that have spoken, uh, you know, in the educational world start with, you know, they, there's a connection between them and the audience, and it's natural, and it means something, and it's organic, because the, the, the audience, the educators are saying, yes, this is what I can bring back to my kids. Because th there's always going to be the students that are, that are uh, come from those families you described that support, it, that, uh, support education, and they have a value in their mind, like, yes, this is good, this is important, I need to do this, I'm listening. But those aren't the, you know, it's the kids that don't have that, that, that we really struggle with that we need to focus on. And any district will tell you, like, oh, we need to focus on this because, you know, state, t state test scores show us that this subgroup is struggling in this area. It all comes back to the relationship they have with kids. And it's more difficult, isn't it, with all the plates spinning to, mm -hmm. to create that warmth and that trust and those mm -hmm. connections. Um, talk about... The parent piece, you know, in the reconnection project, uh, you've read the, uh, the the marketing material. Where where does your mind go when you think of the parents? What what needs to happen to, to help these children as far as the parenting piece? Well, I think to a conversation uh, at, a, at a workshop that uh, that I was a part of with with you and, and I think about the thirty nine forty parents, where the biggest thing I walked away with was the parents telling me like. You know, after that workshop, they felt like it, it's okay for, for my kids to see me struggle. It's okay for my kids to see that I'm having a hard time with something and that I'm working through it. And, and I, I feel that, uh, you know, with, with parents, you know, being a parent myself, it's a matter of, you know, coming to that point where you can realize, like, okay, I, I am struggling, this is difficult, and my kids can see that. I don't need to to deal with it separately and, and, you know, shield them from that so they can continue to be kids and not, you know, worry about them seeing that, you know, I'm dealing with stress finances or job-wise or relationship-wise or what have you. Um, and I think once that barrier can be broken down and, and uh, parents can be, not necessarily that they've got to share everything with their kids, right. but they, you know, that their, their kids can see that, you know, dad's having a hard time right now, he's struggling, but he's working through it. And, you know, my dad is working through this with me. I think that's where wow. the connection is. And that's, that's the family. And I think that's what was happening at dinner table conversations so much more uh, in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s. When I grew up, I, my dad came home, whether even if it was 7 o'clock at night or later, we were always waiting for him to get home. And it was him, my mom, my sister, and I. And we sat down and we had, there was no hats at the table. And, you know, you... You, uh, you know, you, you use your, your manners, but you were, you were a family, and you talked, and, and you were forced, and even if it was silent, you were still there every single night. And, of course, I didn't realize the value of that until I grew up and had my own kids, and now I'm struggling to be able to do that same thing, uh, you know, my, my two girls and I. But, um, you know, when you ask, you know, about the parents and kind of where that piece of the puzzle lies, uh, that it's crucial. 
you know, because you know we only hold on to the kids for for six hours a day, and the rest of them, rest of the time, they're with their parents and their families, and they need to be able to, you know, be free to be themselves and and work together. Um, it's easier said than done, obviously, but that that was what I took from, you know, just sitting in on, on one of our workshops. Now that's interesting. There is something going on where we're not supposed to admit we're struggling. There's something going on with that. It's a complicated octopus, or nineopus, or tenopus. And, and, and uh, I, I think, uh, I sense your determination to sort of get to the bottom of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, we gotta start wrapping this up. We both need to get going, but it only takes five, 10 minutes to set up the old podcast, The Rue. You know, we can get back on it. Mm -hmm. We both have beautiful radio voices. It's very, very clear, right? Oh, yes. Uh, but the more people we can include in these kinds of conversations, the better. I, I would like to get some Hudson parents around the table if you want. It's not hard to do, mm -hmm. particularly if we buy that other microphone and take two minutes plugging it in. Technology can be helpful. It sure can. And I think we get these voices going. And uh, let's wrap our arms around the old uh, sea creature, the digital sea creature, and help kids. That's what we're all in the game for, right? True, true, absolutely. You want to sing the closing song? I, I did not know that there was a closing song. Well, I'm, I'm all ears, though, Jeff. Uh, I think we might have to write a little song. Okay, to be continued? To be continued, maybe the Stay analog tuned. anthem or the, I don't know, take me out to the... Uh, take me out to the uh, ball game? That one uh, might already have been taken. I think that has been used. <laughs> well, we'll have to come up with that. Sure. I'll have a series of digital consultants under my age to figure out it. Sure, it's quite easy. Just There's drag, an drag, and drop. There's an app. <laughs> yeah. be. Anyway, thank you for taking the time to get My on. My pleasure, the, Jeff. Thank you. Raising Kids in the Digital Age podcast. So, over and up. Thanks for listening. Take care. <laughs>